Welcome to the Introduction to Geographic Information Systems and Science lecture series developed by the Quinney College of Natural Resources at Utah State University. Discussion topics for this lecture include the importance of spatial thinking, spatial patterns, geospatial data models, and spatial data types. As we begin to learn about GIS and geospatial analysis, we really need to begin to understand and develop our ability to think spatially. Many people think that they have a fine ability to think spatially, but begin to realize once they start to learn GIS that they have a lot of work to do on their spatial thinking abilities. So to truly understand our world, we must learn to recognize, observe, and evaluate spatial interactions between objects and really do away with any preconceived notions we have with how those things interact with each other. Spatial thinking is important enough that there's an official definition developed by the Natural Resource Council in 2006 that identifies and defines spatial thinking as thinking that finds meaning in the shape, size, orientation, location, direction, and trajectory uh, of objects processes or phenomena. So really it defines what GIS is used for and why we conduct geospatial analysis. So as a brief exercise to start getting our minds used to thinking spatially, I want you to go ahead and observe everything or as much as you can in the room around you and think about how these things or these objects really interact and how they're related to each other spatially. So take out a piece of scratch paper and jot down a few of these interactions or relationships that you see and describe the spatial relationships, what the spatial relationships or arrangements might mean and while you're thinking along these terms how could you test or verify the meaning of these spatial relationships. As an example if you were taking this course at the USU campus in Logan you would likely be sitting in this room for the lecture portion of the class. So as you can see from the picture, there's a lot of different spatial arrangements and spatial relationships that go on within this room. So at this point, go ahead and pause the video, take a second, write down a few of these spatial relationships that you see within the room that you're in, and then we'll discuss some of the relationships that I see within the room that I would be lecturing in if we were on the USU campus. So looking at your results of what's going on around you and the objects within the room around you, Within the room that we would be in on the USU campus, we would see that chairs generally face the front of the classroom and are contained within the room. Groups or clusters of students may occur. So you have age clusters, perhaps clusters of male and female, uh, clusters by major. We also see, or at least I see from the front of the room, that there's a student proximity to the door as opposed to the front of the classroom or the instructor. People generally want to sit closer to the door so they can get out quicker or leave early. Um, and generally speaking, people are coincident with their chairs. We don't often have people standing around the room. So you generally see people contained or sitting in their chairs. And lastly, the projector screen and the computer are arranged in such a way that they have a relationship with either the audience or the instructor. So as you start to develop your spatial thinking skills, you need to understand that spatial thinking really needs to be critical. You need to learn to ask questions about spatial patterns and relationships to, in order to solve problems and understand phenomena that are occurring. You need to develop hypotheses about patterns and relationships and their underlying processes. And really you need to question the assumptions that you think you have or think you understand about what's going on around you. A few notes on spatial patterns. Spatial configuration of geographic features is a critical component. So simply said, it's important to understand and recognize configuration of features, how things are organized and how things relate spatially to one another. We're generally interested in patterns that are non-random. However, that said, there may be patterns in the data that appear random on first glance, but once you start digging into the processes and really analyzing the data, you'll find non-random patterns that pop out of that data. And lastly, there is typically an underlying process, of course, that derives and that results in the establishment of the pattern. So just a few different types of patterns that we might see. As you're looking, you may end up seeing something that appears random. You can see clustered patterns. You may see ev evenly dispersed patterns. Evenly dispersed patterns are often used in sampling methods, um, though you can see clustered or random sampling as well. What you really need to be careful with is that what may appear random may not actually be random. So keep that in mind. Just a couple of quick examples. Dr. John Snow, known as the father of epidemiology and spatial analysis, really developed some critical spatial thinking concepts, uh, including point clustering and really the zone of influence. In 1854, near London, there was an outbreak of cholera, 
and he was mapping and treating these people and really mapping the locations of the deaths and you can see on the slide there there were many deaths and his goal was to find out what was causing these deaths so he placed all of these on the on a map and he was able to go ahead and find essentially the geometric center of all of these deaths which actually ended up relating to the water pump which is now a famous feature that you can go and visit as a tourist but that once that pump was shut down he was able to uh, stem the the cholera and really uh, s uh, stop the the number of deaths that were occurring from that pump so really kind of a neat example of thinking spatially another example is connectivity we can look at things and th how things are connected and we do this often when we're using GIS and geospatial tools but in this example what do the road patterns tell us about early and modern Rome so take a look at that map what do you see in the in the pattern of the roads in the network of the roads do they appear connected yes they appear quite well connected and the idea here is really the the saying the old saying that all roads lead to Rome so you can see that there's spatial connectivity the idea was to get goods and services into Rome here's another example without knowing any spatial context here why do you think these roads appear so disconnected as opposed to the previous slide that appeared so connected if we provide a little bit more spatial information what you can see is that those roads really are geographically topography and culturally influenced so this is a shot of uh, southern Utah region and there's a lot of two track and small roads out in the area but they're very well uh, disconnected because of the topography and, and geography of the region and finally, thinking spatially as a feature orientation, if we look at a river system and we think about what's going on here, uh, this river system of Texas, we can kind of see a general pattern or trend. All the rivers kind of flow in a certain direction. And without knowing anything else, although I hope you understand your geography well enough to know why the river system would flow a certain direction, we can start to see that we have elevational changes from west to east towards the Gulf of Mexico. So you can see that those river patterns all generally trend down towards the Gulf and ultimately into the, the Gulf of Mexico itself. An idea of some regions, just thinking in, in a region term, here's a couple of different maps that show ecoregions that describe uh, vegetation and, and land cover types. We have climatic life zones and then of course the far right there is the Southwest Regional Gap land cover which identifies different land cover types, so different types of regions generally these regions are broad assessments of what's going on the ground so we we've talked about this idea of thinking spatially and now we really want to transition into geospatial analysis and the idea of developing our ability to think spatially and conduct geospatial analysis requires us as humans to develop methods of creating and storing geospatial data so the the world that we look at is infinitely complex it's a very complex place and really computers and the human mind have a finite ability to store and con you know, contemplate all of this information so how do we really decide what we want to capture and how do we store that information so spatial data organization and structure has really developed over the last thirty years to allow us to conduct geospatial analysis and really take apart this infinitely complex world and break it down into models that help us build and understand the world that's around us. So we're able to take all of this infinitely complex information and separate it out so that any one person has a better chance of understanding this all of this data uh, rather than trying to process all of the data as a whole or as in one system. Much as the universe is made up of atomic elements, the geographic universe or geographic data is composed of what we could call geographic elements. These elements link places or XY locations on the surface or near the surface of the earth. They link them with time and usually some sort of description or attribute. As an example of this, and I'll refer back to this famous fire hydrant several times in our lecture series, this fire hydrant is located in Franklin, Idaho near the Utah-Idaho border. And this fire hydrant has a spatial location, it has an XY location, so we know where it is on the surface of the Earth. It also has attribute data, which is considered non-spatial data, but is tied to that fire hydrant because it has specific details or information about the fire hydrant. 